This week on Theatre Talk... Georgie Nathan established the right of critics. He said, I have the right to leave in the intermission for plays because he said, I made an observation. If it's bad in the first act, it's never any better in the second. <laughs> Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. What story are we going to tell tonight? We are going to tell the story of the Scotsboro Boys. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. John Cullum is celebrating his 50th year on Broadway. He has been in some of the classic productions, including, and the list is very long, Camelot, Shenandoah, A Hamlet with Richard Burton, 1776, On a Clear Day You Can See Forever, On the 20th Century, August Osage County, You're in Town, and he is back on Broadway. I think this is your 28th or 29th production, The Scottsboro Boys. New musical by John Kander and Fred Ebb, and we are delighted to have John Cullum with us tonight. Welcome. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Now, uh, 50 years on Broadway, what does that mean that you're referred to in reviews now as a veteran, veteran Broadway performer, John Cullum? <laughs> the veteran's veteran, that's what I mean. <laughs> now, how does a nice boy from Tennessee wind up on Broadway? That's where you're from, right, Tennessee? That's right. Well, I actually got a very good education at the University of Tennessee in Broadway plays hmm. because... Um, we didn't even have a theater, so we used an old theater that's very similar to the Lyceum. Where you are right now. Right, with the, with the third balcony up the top, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a separate entrance for uh, black patrons. Yeah. And um, and we did all the Broadway shows, things like, uh, well, Front Page, um, uh, All My Sons, Come Back, Little Sheba, The Heiress, about 16 Broadway shows that I did there. Hmm. in f four or five years. But when did the, the, the acting bug bite you? How old were you when you... Uh, I remember, my first remembrance was playing a tree in an Easter pageant in the, when I was in the fifth grade. Hmm. And uh, that's then, and I always was a kind of a show-off or a performer from grammar school through junior high school and high school and then into college, but I never intended to be a professional actor. Really? No, I didn't never, it, it really didn't occur to me. I could just as easily have be, become a professional tennis player, or I was uh, offered a, a regular army commission, mm -hmm. and uh, any of those areas. And then, of course, I was, went back to school and was ma majoring in finance, at uh, getting a, a master's in finance and working in my dad's office, uh, where he had a lovely little business all set up for me to take over, hmm. when I decided... Well, you just decided I want to come to New York and... Well, it was a little more than that. Oh, well, what was it? What happened, yeah. Well, the, I was living three different lives. I was the choir conductor for the Dixie Lee Jun Junction Baptist Church, <laughs> and I was um, in the theater, and I was in school and working in my dad's office all these, and, and I was... A, you know, tennis player and all this stuff. Then, then I was picked up for drunken driving, and um, it, it kind of hit the papers. and And I chose to believe that everybody had turned against me and that sort of thing. And it gave me an excuse to say to my dad, "I want to give it a chance." Hmm. And, uh, and leave town. You wanted to get out of town because of right. the embarrassment. I, wow. le I left Knoxville to get out of to get out, but um, there must have been a reason why. So it was the divine hand of fate. Probably, probably so. Maybe not so divine, but yeah. <laughs> at least it, it, it got it was me. It's the divine hand of the bartender, I think, that yeah. uh, got you out of yeah. town. Yeah, but uh, I ended up getting a, into a production of Saint Joan with Siobhan McKenna. Oh yeah, yeah, a wonderful production, and I was a spear carrier in that. And uh, while I was there, I, I I heard about an audition for Shakespeare. Well, I couldn't get auditions for straight plays at all. And I'd never done any Shakespeare. We didn't do Shakespeare at the University of Tennessee. And, uh, but I could easily do Shakespeare because I was brought up on the King James Version of the Bible. So you had the language. That's the right. So I, I, went to, I went to this audition. And uh, uh, as I was sitting, in, I'd, I'd learned this speech, you know, and I'd, uh, I, thought I, I thought it was really good. So, but this was this gorgeous young blonde sitting out there. And, 
she would eventually end up playing the Ophelia. Helen Marie Taylor was her name. And she said, you don't, there's no point in you reading for the Hamlet. I said, why don't you read for Laertes? That's what you're really right for. So I said, okay. So I started looking over the Laertes and read through the Laertes and so forth. And, and I was the last person because uh, I didn't have a, an appointment. And I walked in through the, through the studio and, and they said, Mr. Cullen, we understand you have, uh, you, you prepared something from, from Hamlet, the, the, the Hamlet's uh, speech. I said, yes, but I was, and they said, would, would you mind doing that, please? Everybody was kind of tired and irritable. So I went up there and I, I put the, 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 the the, the, the script down, I said, this is the skull, I said. Alas, poor Yorick. I, I said, do you mind if I start again? And I said, <clears throat> alas, poor Yorick. I said, alas, poor, I said, look, you know, I've forgotten this whole speech because I've been working on the Laertes. Do you mind if I read the Laertes to you? <laughs> and it was a question. They said, well, okay. <laughs> so I read this Laertes part, and then and the, and the, and the, and the stage manager was dragging me out. And he said, and the, and the director said, I, I said, well, listen, I'll be glad to read anything else you want. He, the director <laughs> said, wait a minute, bring, bring that guy back here. <laughs> and they said, they, they, they had combined a, a, some speeches of Rosencrantz and Gillenstern. So I read it cold. But it was so simple and wonderful, easy for me to read. I went right through this whole thing. And I walked out and forgot about it. So I was sitting there. I was working in the office down there at the Phoenix Theater. And they, I got a call. And I went and I said, oh, who called me here? And then it was the stage manager from the Hamlet. He said, we're interested in you playing the, uh, the uh, Rosencrantz and doubling as Marcellus. And I thought, I said, well, I said, those are uh, rather small parts, aren't they? And there was a kind of a pause on them. And said, They're very good parts, Mr. Cullum. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I, you know, I'm going to have to think about it. I, I, see, I, I've been playing leads back <laughs> in, in Tennessee, Tennessee, and I thought, they should know that I'm a leading actor. <laughs> well, I, I went back and sat down in the office and was typing away, making all kind of errors and stuff. And I said to the general public, I said, you know, these people from the Shakespeareites called me. And they wanted me to do R Rosencrantz and double as Marcellus. And I said, I don't know. And there was a quiet pause, and a guy came over and took me by the ear, said, you go back in there, you call those people, tell them that you'll do it. Mm -hmm. So I called them, and that was my, that was my and first. You, and you began. That but was you, my you first You played show. Laertes in Richard Burton's Hamlet, too. That's you? right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the audition for that was even worse. What was that? <laughs> was Burton there? <laughs> no, but he recommended me to, to John <laughs> John Gilgood. So I walked in to do the reading. See, well, I had, you know, I'd been in a couple of productions of Hamlet by that time, mm -hmm. and um, and I knew the Laertes. And there's one big speech that I just I could never make sense of. My necessaries are embarked, sister. My necessaries are embarked. And while the wind sits, so blah 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 blah. A long speech that I could never make sense out of, and I knew it was always cut. So <laughs> I said. Sir John said to me, he says, oh, uh, John, uh, Richard thinks you're a good actor. And I said, well, thank you. He said, what would you like to read? I said, well, Sir John, I'd, anything. I, I know the play pretty well. I, anything you want me to read. He said, I love that speech. My necessities are embarked. And I, said, I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> and I, said, I tried to read this speech cold. It was really awful. <laughs> and John Gilgood came walking down. He says, Richard thinks you're a good actor. <laughs> I thought, oh, God. Well, I, I left. Well, Richard <laughs> called John and Sir John and told him he had to read me again. And believe me, I got the speech. What was <laughs> Richard Burton like to be with? I mean, one hears the stories that, you know, he had quite an interesting life offstage and was a very big drinker but could perform while he was drinking. Yes, and uh, I had known him from from Camelot. Yeah. I was his understudy, and I got into Camelot and into musical comedy because of my classical training, mm. or not. I hadn't had that much training. I thought I was God's gift to the classic theater, but I hadn't really done that much. Mm. I'd done three or four plays with the Shakespeare right? and then I had done a season with Joe Papp. Alan J. Lerner's assistant came to see a production in which I had to do the chorus. 
uh, because uh, Chimino, the guy who's playing it, had sprained his knee uh, playing softball, and Joe Papp came and said, John, you're going to have to do it. It was a preview. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, well, that's fine. He said, so he went out and he made this announcement that Mr. Cullum is gladly, but he, of course he'll have to carry the book. And so naturally, I knew that first thing. Oh, for a muse of fire, <laughs> for a sin, the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom, as a child. And I just ripped the stage apart. And then the rest of the evening, I went out of flashlight and I had to creep around <laughs> reading the course for the rest of the time. But they saw me do that, see? And so when I went to audition, which I hated to do, uh, auditioning, <laughs> there was a, the guy in the show called Arthur Mallet that was a wonderful actor. And he was a character actor, and we were drinking buddies. And uh, he was in, he had a crush on Kathleen Widows, as we all did. Yeah, beautiful. And um, uh, he called one morning, and uh, he was feeling very morose. And I said, where, where are you, Arthur? He says, I'm down at Gately's Bar. I said, I'll be there in two minutes, <laughs> because it wasn't too far from where I was. And I walked down there, and I consoled him. <laughs> I was consoling him for about three hours, see, so and it was about, got to be around 4.30, and I said, um, you know, I said, Arthur, I said, you know, uh, I have an audition for a new musical called Camelot, and he says, fine, that's wonderful, he says, what time is your audition? I said, it's at 2 o'clock. He says, well, if you hurry, you'll only be two and a half hours late. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I went up, I went up to, the, uh, to, the, to the theater, and there, were, there was just a few people left up there, and they handed me this paper that had on it uh, all kind of things that you could write on. And so, so I scrawled across the face, graduate of the University of Tennessee, see, and gave it back to him. And then I strolled out on the stage. I was the last person to, to, to audition that day. And, and they said, well, Mr. Cullen, we understand that, that you, um, you went to the University of Tennessee. And I said, that's, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> they said, well, have you done anything else? And I said, yes, but I didn't think you'd be interested. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I was a member of the Dallas Repertory Company. I just returned. And then uh, th th they said, uh, well, it's only, have you prepared anything to sing? And I said, yeah. And I'd been working with my wife, who was a choreographer, Emily Frankel. And she said, you use your hands too much. You gesture all through your numbers. Well, I use the gestures to, so, to help me remember lines because I've always had trouble learning lyrics. Mm. So she, she said, just don't move your hands at all. Just stand stock still. At the end, you can raise your hand like this. There but for you go I. And I was singing a song, There But For You Go I, that was written by Alan J. Lerner and uh, uh, Frederick Lowe. And I didn't even know that I was auditioning for this, these people. That's how. They how, were out there and you were. They were out there auditioning with Moss Hart. See? <laughs> and uh, so I sing this song and I get to the last note and I put up my arms and I start rocking back and forth. And then I. Pulled myself together, walked off. I thought, that's the end of that. Thank goodness. And then, then they called me back. And they called me out there, and I thought, this is it. But forget it. But they said, Mr. Cullum, can, can you do something from Shakespeare? I said, I beg your pardon? And they said, can you do something from Shakespeare? I said, I can do practically anything from Shakespeare. Which, is, which was not true, of course, but at the time I thought, I'd, I'd, having worked so hard to learn all these different roles. They said, well, we, we understand you're doing uh, Henry V, uh, at, and uh, could you do something from that? I said, yes, of course, I'll, I'll do the, um, uh, the, the opening chorus. And I, I started to do my big thing and, and said, no, 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 Mr. Cullum, we've heard you sing. Uh, we want you to do something from the script. I thought, oh my God, they, they don't know that. I said, all right, I'll, I'll do the opening lines of Henry V. Oh, for a muse, a far off, a far off, a far off, a far And your old trick. I, that's right. I did my, my, my shtick. And, and Moss Hart and Alan J. Lerner came up and they said, Mr. Cullum, we'd like for you to stand by for Richard Burton, play the role of Denadan, and also stand by for Roddy McDowell as Mordred. 
and, I, I, and would you consider that? And I said, how long do I have to consider it? Oh. And they said, well, we're starting rehearsal next week. And I said, I have considered it. I said, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I, that's how I got into that. I want to ask you, you, you you've worked with the amazing directors, Gil Good, Moss Hart, Alan J. Lerner. Who is the best? Well, they were all, they were all, um, they all had their own strengths. Um, Neil Good was the most sensitive and most knowledgeable. Mm. Uh, Moss Hart was the most theatrical. Mm. He knew what would work, and he was often put down for it, but it worked. Mm. Who else did you mention? Well, Alan J. Lerner, of course, on, on A Clear Day, which had a lot of trouble, as we know. Well, Alan was not a, really a director. I don't know, I, t I can tell you this, story, but you know that in... In, in Camelot, uh, uh, Richard's foster father took over for the directing and rewrote a lot of the script after we got to Boston. Uh, Richard instigated that and it worked and he never took credit, was never, there's, no, there's no mention anywhere of, of Phil Burton doing that. But Rewriting Phil, Camelot. He, wow. he, he tied it together because uh, Moss Hart had gotten, uh, had had a mild heart attack and Alan J. Lerner had, had ulcers. They both went to the hospital. <laughs> they just crossed <laughs> up in Toronto. They just crossed out Moss Hart's name and, the, and room number and put in Alan J. Lerner. And put it wow. I'm working with one of the best. I was going to ask you, well, you've got yeah. one of the best right now, Susan Stroman on Scottsboro she Boys. She really has a terrific instinct for she's she's a she's a choreographer which means she works our tails off and she never gives you an inch of i mean you're seldom ever let out 15 if you get 15 minutes out of a 10 out of 12 hour day if, if she lets you go 15 minutes early you you're thankful <laughs> but, but she is very astute uh, uh, as far as directing and knowing what happens on the stage and has a wonderful spirit that permeates the company. These people on a, are on a mission. We have a prayer meeting before, or sometimes last night we had a sermon. Now how does that go? What do you mean by a sermon? They, they have to give, we all meet uh, five minutes before the curtain, before uh, the curtain and uh, hold hands and, and they sing songs, they sing songs that I know, religious songs, or they sing contemporary songs, and, and they just get in the spirit of it all, and then they have, they all, we all hold hands and have testimonials. Does that help you in the performance that comes after? It helps them, and it helps, and I, I'm, you know, I'm the outsider. It yes, makes me yes. feel like I'm at least a part of this group. And my role is, a, it's a tough role uh, for me. Uh, tell what, us what you play. Yeah, well, yeah, tell us about that. Well. It, you know, he's, he's, it's, I'm playing an aspect of myself, and he's not, he's not a person, I have to go into areas that, that uh, are disagreeable and, and uh, to me. And we should myself. say you're called the interlocutor, correct? Interlocutor. And you're, and you're the host of this minstrel show, That's which right. frames the Scottsboro That's Boys. Right. And, you, mm -hmm. and you, you represent all white people in a certain way. To a certain extent, yeah. that, that's true. Uh, but uh, I become enmeshed in the story, as do all the other people. Uh, we're, we're telling, we've been doing um, this minstrel show theoretically for quite some time, but this particular night, one of the actors says, can we tell the truth? That's right, we're telling your story, boys, just like we always do. Mr. Interlocutor, this time can we tell it like it really happened? This time can we tell the truth? Of course, Haywood. Have you ever told the truth before, Mr. Tambo? Is that what we're doing? Yes. And I say, I make the mistake of saying, well, yes, we'll tell the truth tonight. And as the story progresses this time, we begin to see all the dark sides, and it's intermeshed with the with the uh, with a caricature of, uh, of 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 all these characters that you see in minstrels, and my character um, stays as the interlocutor, but he becomes involved with the people, and you begin to see traces of of deep seated prejudice that I don't know I have. I, I guess it's because you grew up in the South. That's right. Uh, you do this cakewalk, which is one of the most amazing dances I've seen, and I, I don't think anybody on Broadway but you could do a real cakewalk because it's in your bones. 
<laughs> That's right. We used to do cakewalks all the time <laughs> down there. We hey. cakewalked around every Christmas, every <laughs> Thanksgiving, every we did the cakewalk all the time. It's very gripping what you're doing and telling the true story yes. of the Scottsboro Boys case. Yes. And do you draw on your memories of growing oh. up in Tennessee oh. when you know the blacks, as you said, had the separate entrance at oh, the theater? The, yes, yeah, it's, it, it's it's painful sometimes to me some of the stuff that I have to dredge up that, but it, no question about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I blame it on my dad and my uncles and my husband, but we're, you know, when you start digging deep into yourself with some, some of these things, you, you keep, you know, it's like a, uh, I don't know, you discover something rotten in yourself mm -hmm. that you didn't think was there. And these boys that are doing the show are not just doing the show, they're all wonderful actors, but they're on a mission. Mm -hmm. They want to tell the story of the Scottsboro Boys. Yeah. Well, it's a terrific musical, and uh, you are magnificent in it. You're, I don't know, we can't even tell you how many performances have been on Broadway. You have 28, 29 shows, 20, I'm yeah, trying to tally up. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, Monica. Well, John Colm, thank you for being our guest on it's Theater a, Talk. Thank a, you so, so much. You made it so nice. And to we be wish here. you have a nice long run at the Scottsboro Boys thank at uh, the Lyceum Theater. That's right. right. Nice on 45th. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. A cakewalk! No power to the weak, and that's how it should be. You didn't bring your man. We did, right here. He's right here. He's right here. Yeah, so sit down. Did you take some? Yeah, yeah, but we're going to ask you a couple of quick questions, so yes. get yourself comfortable. Eric, any advice to getting to be 95? Oh, gosh. I don't believe in uh, prolongation of life on doctors. <laughs> And how about leaving bad plays at intermission? Uh, you know, George E. Nathan established the right of critics. He, in the middle of his career, he said, I have the right to leave in the intermission for plays, because he said, in my earlier career, I saw plays through to the end, hundreds of them, and I made an observation. If it's bad in the first hour, it's never any better in the second <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> So you can leave. <laughs> so you can leave. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're happy to birthday, too. Yes, I am. Joe Quinn. Yes. I have your book about my Shakespeare books. I got terrible reviews originally. Yes. But now, it's getting much more respect. Well, well, because uh, everyone wants to be gay now. <laughs> I was curious something you said that you, some of the things you go back to reading now, you go back to reading the Bible. Yes. Why? Because um, I'm interested in getting to the bottom of this whole discussion of what's going on in religion and what we're missing, those of us who don't accept the doctrines of face value. Mm -hmm. Um, but we don't want to be put down as standing less, you know. Um, one of my sons told me when he was younger that, that I'd missed out on, I hadn't given him religion. And uh, I thought about that, but it seemed to me his mother and I had given him things that we thought were better. Shaw said all the religions are one, and he believed in it. <laughs> right. Mr. Bentley, can I take a picture with you? I would be so thrilled. Thank you. There you go. Oh, thank you. Eric, happy birthday. I'll call you for a dinner, okay? Thanks for coming. I grew up in England. I was a member of the uh, Independent Labour Party, which was a very left-wing party, but hostile to the Soviet Union, non-Soviet. Non and um, I really haven't changed my political views since. Uh, you know, when they say Obama is really a socialist, I only wish he was. Uh, <laughs> so my criticism of Broadway was really of, of Broadway as a business, as a representative, as, as a, you know, in the service of capitalism and the wealth of those individuals. <coughs> and I think this applies to the audience also. Uh, you see, Broadway theater is, is a theater for the rich. 
theater tickets, a good tickets, are hundred dollars a shot now. Uh, that's not a, a, a healthy theater. I, I was de deeply influenced all my life by a, 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 rem a remark of Goethe to the effect that uh, your your life should not should not end with the end of your formal education. Nor should your education end there. It should begin there. And you, sp you spend the whole rest of your life investigating further and educating yourself more. I've tried to do that. I'm still doing that, as a matter of fact, even though I'm probably not able to write now. But I'm reading a lot in, in, the word, in the, trying to understand the world <laughs> better than I have. Uh, it, keep, it keeps me alive, it keeps me awake. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night.